Welcome to the Going to Seed podcast. I'm your host, Shane Simonson, and today our guest is Thulan, who has started a very inspirational breeding project on silverweed. So do you want to start us off by telling us a bit about this unusual plant? It's not that unusual, actually. So most people think of it as a weed. I don't know anyone who's planted it ornamentally. I've seen it in people's gardens when I walk past I'm sure they're just escapes from somewhere else. You go walking and you bring some seeds back. Can so, you give us um, a quick description of what it looks like? Yeah, it's a biennial creeping plant with leaves that are divided into leaflets. And they kind of, they all come from a central point and they kind of droop out. And it's divided into leaflets and each leaflet, it's got like little teeth, mm-hmm. right? And you can tell it's silverweed because it, if you look at it, it looks silver. And the reason, if you look closer, is that there's lots of little fine hairs all over it. And the fine hairs, they give it a silvery appearance. Mm. And if a specimen is healthy, which it generally is because it can survive anything, it it generally sends out these roots like a wild strawberry, which people have seen probably. And they're like red. They're called stolons, but they're like little stems that shoot off. And then whenever they contact ground, they they send out roots that go down deep. So it's um, a relatively small growing perennial, like maybe a foot it, tall? A foot. What's a foot? Oh, uh, 30, 30 centimetres. Centimeters. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if it's like, so it's got quite a lot of morphology, morphological variability, right? Mm. So I'll talk about that in a sec. Mm. So, so what makes silverweed special is that, well, it, it spreads like wildfire. Like it, it can grow in gravel, it could just grow in dirt, poor soil. Really, the only things it requires are plenty of moisture and like a bit of shade. But it can grow in full sun if it's got enough moisture. And the thing right. that the audience is probably most interested in is why yeah. is this useful as a potential crop? Because you're hoping to domesticate this wild species. Yes, yeah. I'm hoping to domesticate it, but also keep some of the wildness right Mm. so the reason why i want to domesticate it is that it's got these the underground structure is where it's the most interesting it's got these really deep storage roots that go down probably more than 30 centimeters if you let it Mm. Uh, if you grow in containers it's different so it's got these big big for a wild plant storage roots like maybe a pencil in thickness Mm. and then after storage roots, there's these kind of what I call feeder roots. And the feeder roots gather the nutrient and then they store the nutrient in the storage roots for leaner times. Mm-hmm. So what happens is it's it's perennial. So when I said biennial, I don't mean that it's, it dies back in the second year. I mean, it flowers in the second year mm-hmm. from when it's seeded, right? So it's perennial and it dies back in the winter. You think it's dead and, it, and in... It's one of the first plants to come back in the spring because it uses all the energy in its storage roots and it comes back strong, right? So you can treat it really badly and it, it just, you know, it, it's fine with it. It doesn't care because it's got a lot of the nutrient in its root. What are the um, traditional uses of silverweed as a, a food plant? In most cultures, actually, even in English culture, like it's generally people call it like a famine crop. So they use it when all else fails. And I think the reason why they do that is because it's a bit fiddly to harvest, right? Like, like, so what I just said, it grows in terrible ground. That means like when you dig it up, it takes a lot of work, but there are some cultures where they harvested it as, you know, the main crop and the relative of it, relative of it, which is called Pacific silverweed, which is Argentina Pacifica or Potentilla Pacifica. That was grown in loose, loamy beds by the Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was a matter of prestige. You know, like it, it got to the point where, you know, people in high status in the clan would be reserved the longest and thickest roots to have. Mm. So, you know, and the reason, you know, it wasn't, it, well, I've tried cooking it and it's like nutty and like quite flowery in taste. And, you know, you can fry it, so then it's, like, crunchy, which is quite nice as, like, you know, like, if you're as a snack. Or I've read that you can grind it into a flour. Mm. And the Asians, Chinese people, like, Nepalese, they cook it in stews, like, 
like in the the plains of Russia, like it goes nice in stews. And it's not just a tasting, it's got higher, it's got pound for pound, it's got a higher carbohydrate, well, it's got a higher carbohydrate density than potato. Mm. Mm. So you don't need to eat as much. You don't need to eat as much, and it's higher in nutrient. It's got more varied nutrient. So people say potato is a wonder crop. So silverweed because it's Mm. you don't need you know you don't need to eat as much, and it's better for you. Just if Mark if Mark Watney had if Mark Watney had silverweed on the Martian, (laughs) then then he might have easier job. Yeah, yeah, because one of the great things about it when I said I want to semi-domesticate it is that I want to leave the stolons alone because then you don't need to plant as many. You you can have, like, a field if you were wanting to still do monoculture because mm. it's not really affected by any diseases I've seen. And it, it'll just... You plant a few and it'll just spread itself out prolifically. Mm. You don't have to do anything. Like, you know, like it's a self-perpetuating perennial root crop. You'll never get all of the root fragments, so it'll just keep regrowing. It's mm. like Jerusalem artichoke, but worse because Jerusalem artichokes don't spread themselves with stolons. Mm. So do you want to just let us know a little bit about your background and what led you towards plant breeding to crop breeding? Well, my background doesn't have anything to do with anything in the real life. I, I studied physics at university and then I did theoretical physics in for a phd because i couldn't find a job and i thought i liked it but then i quickly discovered i didn't like it and i just forced myself to finish my phd and then i did a well well, then i looked around and i found a job in software development and i did I, i did really love that but then covid happened and then we all got locked in in the uk and i discovered that well, I needed an outlet and I just started looking into the garden and, you know, I discovered what well, I wanted an outlet, but I didn't want it to be really high maintenance. So mm-hmm. I thought annual vegetables really fussy. It always needed sun. And then I started researching shady vegetables that got me into perennial vegetables. I read Martin Crawford's book on perennial vegetables, which opened a whole new world to me. And he kept name dropping the forest garden book that he wrote. And I read that one and, you know, that was like a light going off in my head. And I said to my wife, can I have the back half of the garden to turn into a forest garden? And we agreed and I did that. Well, whilst I was doing the research into it, forest gardens, I discovered that people, they always just talk about like fruits, lots of different types of fruits. Mm. People into forest gardens just love fruits. And then I, if it's not fruits, then it's leafy vegetables. But I think that we're missing part of the food pyramid is we need a carbohydrate, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a paradox with the perennial carbohydrate, because if you harvest it, it's not perennial anymore, Mm -hmm. right? With some exceptions, I suppose. So anyway, I started looking it up and then I saw people talk about silverweed. And then I read that Ken Fern, he talks about silverweed having a great potential for breeding. Mm -hmm. And that became a mind worm for me. And then I started thinking about it and I was like, oh, why don't I try getting some silver weed in? So I bought some silver weed from eBay, planted it, it grew like crazy. And I was like, this is amazing. So I was like, oh, and then I decided that, you know, I get silver weed from other places because it's, it's just the weed, like that's the name of it. So I found some when I was going for hikes and stuff and I brought it back home. And I was like, ah, oh, I will try and breed it. You know, I didn't really know much about it. I just thought, oh, you know, I quite like collecting stuff. So I just started collecting silverweed samples from wherever I went. Mm. And I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'll write about it online. So I wrote a blog about it online. And then someone got in touch with me and said, oh, you know, you should talk about this, you know, with this plant breeding community on Facebook. And then things went from strength to strength there because then I got, talking to more and more people and eventually I talked to you and then like I learned more I read all the research papers about specifically silverweed and I learned a lot more about it so that's what happened there we, we definitely live in a golden age for being able to access information and reach out to other people the, the internet is just so amazing everything is just at our fingertips yeah yeah it, it you know like 
I'll make the most of it for now. Mm. Like, we'll just see how long it lasts for, eh? Mm. Now, I would love to hear more about what your growing space is like, what your conditions are, because I think you're a great example about how much you can do with a relatively small space. So I've got, like, your typical suburban back garden for the UK. So in the UK, we it's quite common to have semi-detached houses, which is, I live in half of a house. So it's quite, a, for the UK, it's what you call a fairly big house, but people, they have, they live in half of it. So my family lives in one half, and then there's a lady who lives on the other half. And there's a plot of land that is carved. And then it's probably 100 square metres-ish, but then half of it's left over for, like, lawn and patio for, like, my child and my dog and stuff. And then the other half at the back is is the food foresty area, yeah. You know, in the UK, in my area, it's very damp. And so it's quite funny because when I hear people talk about food forests and, you know, like regenerative agriculture, the main problem people talk about is, oh, you know, swales and like trying to make sure that they able to like manage and channel the water i don't have those issues i get plenty of water and i don't get it all at the same time mm-hmm. my biggest issue is that the high degree of moisture and the high 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 cloud cover means that i have struggles with growing ripening crops or like crops going on oh, there's not enough sun mm-hmm. and then like it doesn't fruit or like the rain comes and it washes all the pollen away fertilized mm-hmm. pollen and then i don't get a fruit set mm-hmm. so like those are my problems or i like, may be a bit of mildew mm-hmm. even amongst wild plants so yeah that's they're my problems which people don't talk about very often <laughs> but that's why silverweed is such a great choice for you because it grows locally and it absolutely loves your conditions yeah it, re- it really does yeah so like last year we had a heat wave and the silverweed that was growing in pots really struggled So I had to move them into deep shade and water them. In the ground, the silver weed was fine, you know, like because the deep roots went really down and tapped the water table. But in pots, you know, like you're basically torturing the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, I was torturing them so I I could look at the roots. And so I just like, you know, like they they really struggled. But yeah. Mm. Um, So you've expanded your focus beyond the original kind of core species of silverweed. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you um, researched and then tracked down wider genetic material and what your aims are there? Yeah, that was your fault. Huh? Well, I, at some point I talked to you and you were like, I can't remember what how we started talking, but you were like, oh, you know, you really need to breed it with like things in the potentilla genus. And, and how big again weed, is this genus? 500 plus species. 500 species so, to tap into. That is amazing. <laughs> so, so, so Potentilla, I mean, potent silverweed, it, it's, it's actually called common silverweed, right? Mm-hmm. So, silverweed is known as Potentilla, was known as Potentilla ansuina, right? And then some guys came along and decided to reclassify it as Argentina ansuina. And, and they split until it up into basically two genuses they call so argentina mm. and potentilla argentina now we call silver weeds mm. and potentilla we call sunk foils mm-hmm. sunk foils they're called sunk foils because usually they've got five leaves and they're usually like in a radial like the leaves come up from a single point and they're radially spread and there's usually five of nearly everything so five leaves made of leaves of five leaflets i mean like two flits and then the petals of a plant usually like can often be five. Mm. It can be variable, but it's often five. So it's called sunk foil, five five foil or whatever, mm. right? And then Argentina, Argentina. I was researching last night because I was like, why is it called Argentina? So I think that it's called Argentina just because they first found it in Argentina. The first guy who mentioned it. I can't remember his name. The first guy who mentioned it, he mentioned it because he found it in Argentina. And later on that, they found out that it wasn't a native to Argentina. It was native to New, like North Mexico or New Mexico. Yeah, which is kind of next next to, well, near Argentina, I think. I don't know US geography at all. It's near, <laughs> it's in South America somewhere, right? So they found out that it was native to Mexico 
and but the first guy who found it found it in Argentina, which is a shame because I like the term potentillum more because potentillum means like something that's really strong, mm. but that's fine. And Serena means like of the goose, which means it's like uh, and they called it of the goose because they used to chop it up and feed it to geese as ah, like a healthy feed. There you go. Well, like the leaves themselves are high nutrient and. Uh, the whole plant is good for gut health anyway, so, you know. And animals, they eat nearly anything, they think. So, you know. Um, so what, what so anyway, species it, it was your did fault. you look for to bring <laughs> into the breeding project? Because, yeah, I'm, I was really impressed to see you follow this up. Yeah, well, you know, I, I did want to follow it up. What did I pick? So I picked Potentilla nepalis, which is Nepal sunk oil. And I picked Potentilla nuyania, which is, I've forgotten the name of it. The, the common name, and I picked Potentilla erecta, which is commonly known as Tormentil. That one's quite famous because it's it's the the roots of it are more bitter than oak. Now, oak high, is famous for being in high in tannin, yeah. but it, it, tan, uh, Tormentil is even higher. Mm. So it has popular medicinal properties, right? So um, were you mostly focusing on species that had either edible roots or thickened roots? It was a mixture of those, right? So like when I was looking at the species, first I had to narrow it down. So I was like, well, there's 500 species. I can't possibly source them all. Mm. And then I couldn't source them all because no one stocks all 500. Mm. And I couldn't get most of them easily. Like So people sell Potentilla ornamentally. Right, so the ones that are popular are Nepalensis. Well, the, the ones that are popular are, they generally look pretty and they're not, what do you call it, invasive. When I say invasive, they don't spread themselves really. So Nepalensis doesn't spread itself. So, but I saw that pop up a lot in my searches and I was like, I wonder if that's medicinal. And I looked it up and it turns out that it was used as a red dye. And I found this one obscure reference on the Plants for a Future database that said that had starchy roots mm. and i'm like but i couldn't find a book right you often find that like you find this citation and then it's like very poorly sourced it you yeah, don't you yeah, don't know if they're telling the it's, truth it's, it's some note from the 1800s that somebody put on the internet but you'll good luck finding the original yeah i might i might visit visit the british library and find the book at which it cites it mm. but you know i it, i could find a book and then the book will point to another book and then i'll be really annoyed <laughs> um, end of so, the day you have to find the genetics yeah. of that species that does what it says it does so you just have to grab whatever you can and, and grow it and see what it does yeah so i wrote like I, I researched quite a lot into it i wrote a substack article about everything i could learn about the edibility and medicinal properties so i was like well it's easily sourced quite hardy so i'll get that one and look after it and see if i can breed that because it's if it's edible then at least when you cross them the chances of inedibility reduced but then there was some kind of moonshots which is anna's new Miania is one of the moonshots because it it's the, one of the earliest flowering sunk foils out there like it flowers just after winter so i was like oh that's like quite interesting like maybe you could breed that in but it, in terms of medicinal uses, is very, very scant. It's very little, right? And, and but you I just said thought you're that still was looking. And and the Pacific silverweed that was the major crop for the American Indigenous people. Are you still looking for material of that? Yes, yeah. yes, I am. Like it's, actually, it's worth I'm, I'm putting reading. a big flashing light on that, just in case somebody listening knows where you can get some. Yeah, that'd be really good. Yeah, I, I would really like some of that. You know, like that one is even more invasive, if you could could say that. If I let that one loose around here, that, that would go crazy. Like, I read that that's, <laughs> you know, earlier and more vigorous and lasts longer. But then, you know, that's the qualities you're looking for, if it's mm -hmm. something edible, right? Mm. I picked another one called Potentilla Crancy. I think I wrote an article about that one. And that one... That one specifically, that can like live in Greenland, mm. like that one's really hardy. It doesn't really have any medicinal properties I can think of, but like it's just because it's so hardy, I thought it was worth. Mm. And I was like, it, I found just a seed source, so I grew that one from seed, mm. 
and I actually have three pots. It, you know, like, if this ble- breeding thing goes out, of, you know, it doesn't work out. I should just turn into a potentilla shop. I'll just stock <laughs> as many as I can find and sell it, you know. I'll call myself potentillaworld.com. And if you want a weird species, I'll just sell it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that one. And a really kind lady from the Isle of Skye, she sent me. There's something about her conditions, because the other sky is like terribly windy and cold. It's quite harsh. She sent me some silverweed from her place and it grew. It was the best, the most vigorous of all of the silverweeds I had. Mm. And then she also sent me some Potentilia recta, which people know, like that one spreads like mad. That one, the growth habit, superficially, it looks similar to silverweed, but it doesn't root at each node. It just it grows from a central point really fast, mm. and then it seeds itself. Mm. So that that yeah. fertility in terms of producing seed could be a useful yeah. trait if you can balance it out. Along yeah, yeah. Lines, so I was like, yeah. what what's your pollination strategy for getting the the first hybrids produced? What you mean between the ones I sourced? Yes. You, the the. the yeah, you're talking about intergeneric, like the ones we've just been talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be some interspecies, some intergeneric. I, I assume you'll be trying all of the options to see what takes. Yeah, you know, I have a full-time job, so it's quite hard to, it's quite hard to get out there exactly when the plants are opening the flowers. Mm. I did that. I did a couple of crosses with Nepalensis and silverweed, and actually, the the. So the silverweed, which I use as, the, I think you call it the female. Sorry, that's my dog. We use it as the female. And actually, it, I think it tried to set seed, but it, it was inviolable. Mm. I did a, t- a few. Like well, the, the I was also confounded because it's just been so wet. Mm. And I think the rain has been washing out all of the the pollen from any of the crosses. Like there's, there's I, just I... not been any... I, I should point out that it often yeah. takes a couple of years before everything lines up. So the flowering times often vary for different species every year and they may not overlap until you get lucky. I've been getting terrible flowering, like, mm. you know, maybe as many. I've got quite a lot growing around in my garden and there's only maybe 10 flowers I've seen mm. this year. Like it, it's just the weather's just been terrible. Yeah. And you have to be prepared uh, to like wait until the stars align and then one year you'll have yeah. more seed than you know what to do with. Yeah, so last year was a really good year for setting seed because when I came to seed gathering, you know, there were just a lot and uh, I scattered some into this big, deep pot and those came up and now the pot looks like a like a monster. So I have no idea what's growing in there. So like land race is useful for several reasons, right? So land race is just when you kind of let nature sort it out, but then you kind of select mm. the ones that you want to keep and then you keep you keep basically using nature as a guide for what you want it, it is worth this, pointing out though when yeah. you're creating a new land race sometimes yeah. you need to help the first pollination events either to restore fertility that's been lost in clonally propagated plants like garlic yeah. or to help distantly related plants like different species just make that first connection and once yeah. you get over that hump things get much easier from that point yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, luckily for me, and which is why I even started this project, is silverweed is mostly infertile, self-infertile. Yeah, yeah. Self-incompatible, right? Mm. So, like, I can be sure any seed I get out is a high chance it's been bred. Mm. And I think they breed quite easily. So, yeah, I've been letting that one go. And then, like, the intergeneric hybrids, I've not had much time and the conditions have been right. So I'll just let my pl- the specimens sit this year and hope cross my fingers next year it will be okay yeah. and the fact that it even set seed is a good sign like it tried to set a seed i think yeah you're, so, you're very early in the process like you, you've yeah. just gathered the first species you're getting a handle on how to grow them you're thinking about techniques for getting pollen where you want it to go yeah you're, you're very early in the in the process so it's it's good to ha- keep an open mind about what the possibilities could be yeah yeah absolutely and you mentioned you've already got a pot of seedlings. Yes. Any thoughts on how you might start experimenting with selection strategies? So like maybe when you unpot them, you could check to see if some have better looking roots than others. Yes, that one. In 
I did a Substack post because I noticed that some of the seedlings, one specific seedling was completely naked. And what I mean by that is that, what's the botanical term? It was glabrous. It oh, had yes. no hairs on it. Yeah. So it, if, if you bumped into it and uh, for the first time ever, you wouldn't have called it silverweed. Mm. <laughs> you just call it weed, I guess, because the silveriness comes from the downy hair. Yeah. Because it refracts the light and then makes it look very silvery. Is there a chance it's uh, a hybrid? I did quite a lot of research about it, and it turns out there's a lot of morphological variability uh, yeah. in silverweed. Yeah. Right, so this paper I read, it was done in the 1960s by quite a famous guy, it turns out. The, 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 the types of morphological variability include... So when I said to you that the leaves come out, like usually the leaves are opposite, but there's op there's alt they alternate sometimes. So what it is is that there's a big leaflet on one side of the leaf and then a small one on the other and then and then it alternates like that and then there's like the the the, the teeth depth of the leaf is also variable mm. and then there's a lot of variability in the downiness some plants are completely no down some have down and that one's interesting because that one is if it if it isn't downy it's an indication that the area it came from was very very damp mm. The downiness is a hypothesis is an evolutionary adaptation towards an area which has, I think it's dry during the day, but kind of damp in the morning, then the downiness yeah. gathers the dew. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, so, I think you would have so, decent success just from bringing different yeah. strains of silverweed together and letting them mix yeah. and applying selection. Like the, the interspecies and intergeneric hybrid idea it's just a possibility that might lead somewhere. But even yeah. without that, I think you've still got a really interesting project with a lot of potential. Yeah, I mean, for the first time, I don't, I'm pretty sure no one's ever done what I've done. Mm. And so this thing has never been repeated. You've gathered these things that have been evolving separately for I don't know how many years. They came from a, a certain area in. I can't remember where they came. They came from all, the, the cytological analysis says that they came from a certain area mm. and then they spread out all over the world mm. and then gathered them back up again for the first time in, I don't know, 100,000 years or whatever. And yeah, so it's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scope for just the fact that they've been brought together. Mm. So yeah, they vary a lot. And at the beginning I was like, oh, it's a mutation. It's really rare. And it turns out it's not. And I'll just like I'll just let it come out. That's fine. Yeah. Now let's have some bonus round questions. So yeah. if you could work with any species and like wave a magic wand and get it to do exactly what you want, do you have any like kind of fantasy breeding projects that would fall under that? I'll go from the most plausible to less plausible. <laughs> if I was Luther Burbank, I would breed Jerusalem artichokes mm -hmm. because. They are like a wonder crop, really, apart from they give you a lot of gas. And the gas is down to the inulin, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know if there's anything to do about that, but you could at least somehow reduce the amount of inulin by selecting for it. I don't know if anyone has done that. I think you need, you know, it's not something that you can do easily. I mean, like, you could, like, go around feeding your different specimens to people and asking them how much wind it gives them but really you need a, <laughs> but, but really you need a way of analy analyzing the inulin mm. from the plant right and uh, you need equipment for that i don't know how to do that but I'd, I'd love to i'd love to do that i'll be part of that because if you could somehow reduce the level of inulin to like i don't know 10 percent of what it was mm. it's like the perfect crop because you know, it reconditions ground and you don't mind it growing because you can just dig it up and eat it, right? It's just this amazing crop and the leaves are high in protein. And then slightly less plausible is oak tree, mm -hmm. like in terms of the acorns. Like I know that there are already breeds that are quite low in tannin, mm -hmm. but like I'd, I prefer it where it's so low that you could just eat it. Like you could just use it as like a nut without any processing. You know, the oak tree is a wonderful plant anyways. It's home to so many species and so many cultures revere it as like this source of strength and mystery. But mm. yeah, that would be a great thing to do. But that would take a long time. And then 
even less plausible is something that's actually known to be toxic, which is a horse chestnut. Mm. Uh, what do you call it in America? A buckeye tree or something. Mm. Because in England, they bear like crazy. And I would just sit there going, how many tons of horse chestnuts are just sat there going to waste because we can't eat them? <laughs> and, you know, there's a chance that one of the horse chestnut trees out there has something, has a mutation already, which means it's very low in the specific toxin that it has. Mm. So why don't we try and find that? That'll well, take a long time. Something comparable must have happened with almonds historically, because wild almonds yes, are high in cyanide, and yeah. someone managed to find a tree that had practically no cyanide, and that's the origin of that whole crop. I, I meant to point yeah. out as well, too, that carrots yes. were traditionally grown as a herb originally, yeah. as like a leaf vegetable and for the aromatic seeds, and they were only converted into a crispy vegetable root crop relatively recently. And I think people right? are doing a similar thing with coriander. There's a few rare strains oh. of coriander that have large roots. Not not as big as modern oh. carrots, but it's the beginning of that process. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, ideally, I want silverweed to have roots that are as thick as carrots, mm. right? But so it's basically a carrot that propagates itself by with stories. By runners, That'd yeah, be... that would be wonderful. So then the absolute moonshot is breeding monkey puzzle trees. Oh, yes, Because yes, I just yes. think it's fun. <laughs> yeah, this, this, know, is why I... we, this is why we either have to be immortal or have really good yes. connections to share our work with the next generation. So that's my next question. Like, how do you hope to pass on the work that you're doing to other people, get other people involved? Well, my dream would be one day my daughter came up to me and said, oh, I'm really interested in nature. I want to study it more and at the moment she's not and I don't want to force her too much so but then also even if she does do that I'd like to I'm the single point of failure if something happens to me all these specimens I've gathered are just lost mm. so as soon as I have viable seed I might just send it out in fact I might when I break open my pot of second generation plants I might just send some out to people mm. I mean why not well, um, even just that just, first cross yeah. of unrelated parents is just so valuable. Like, it, it's a starting yeah. point with all that di diversity that can go in different directions. Yeah, and some people have more time and more land, mm. and they can grow more. Mm. So, it, yeah, I just get it out however I can. Seeds, seeds would be really nice because then I could send them to, like, all over the world quite mm. easily. Yeah, that's how, you know, I want to do like a citizen science breeding pro program, ideally, mm -hmm. which Rise Owen did with ochre. Mm -hmm. I think it's paused at the moment, but, you know, they were trying to breed a day neutral version of the ochre, mm -hmm. which means that it, it ripens. It doesn't depend on daylight, to, like when it ripens. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Growing from seed, different. one of the other huge benefits is you can put a project on pause. You can store your seed well for a few years if life gets in the way and then get back to it later. I've, I've had that happen to me recently and it's it, it's been very useful to have that up your sleeve. <laughs> yeah, it'd be really great. So a final opportunity to plug yourself. So how can people get in touch with you and learn more about your project? I have a link tree, which has... Link tree is like a, a, a page where it's got all the links that I visit. It's not a homepage properly. So it's, you know, it's got my Instagram and like my Twitter when I use it and it's got my Substack and a few bits and pieces. Like it's got my thread to the going to seed thread where I talk about silverweed. So I really would hope that someone would jump on and go, oh, I really want to join in, yeah. help you, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You yeah, know, people have been amazing. Your Substack is really great. I'd, I'd strongly recommend people check out your Substack because you blog extensively about your thought process in starting the project and the steps that you've taken getting it off the ground. So I think it serves, oh, as, a it serves as a really good model about all of the potential projects that are out there. There's all of these like semi-edible, semi-wild plants that have all of this potential to be crossed with related species and selected into something useful for local conditions. And uh, I, I think you're the poster child of what can be done. Well, I, I, I'm very, I'm very, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy that is, you know, it just started out as a creative outlet because I spent all day solving logic puzzles. 
because I'm a software developer. So it's like a creative outlet. And yeah, it, you know, I'm glad I still find it fun. So yeah, Link, Linktree is, is the best, but you know, Substack is where I uh, do my long form thoughts. Okay, well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today, Thilan. And I'll encourage people to go and check out your, your ongoing blog. Ah, great. Thanks. Okay. No worries. Bye. Bye.